Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is New York Best's second webinar for 2013, entitled Intellectual Property and Patent Law, What You Should Know About Recent Changes. We're going to just step you through some of the logistics for the call, and we'll get, right, and we'll get started as quickly as possible. First, we really want to thank you for joining us. Your participation means a lot to us and to our speakers. You'll note that the, um, your phone is muted, so we will be taking questions through the chat function in the, text, in the text box that's on the side of your screen. So as the webinar proceeds, if you have a question, please type it into the box, and we will get to as many questions once the presentations are completed. Also importantly, there's a survey at the end of the webinar your feedback is extremely important to us. It's a very brief survey, and we'd just like you to take a minute to fill that out so that we get your feedback. And finally, there's, uh, this webinar is being recorded today, and it will be available through New York Best by just emailing us at info at New York Best. A couple of quick announcements about New York Best. We have two events coming up that we want you to save the date on your calendar. Next week is the Advanced Energy Conference, and New York Best is actually sponsoring a track at that conference related to energy storage, and we encourage you to, to participate in that conference and to stop by our track. Also, on June 11th in New York City, New York Best and the Pew Energy and Climate Center are hosting a one-day forum focused on energy storage and microgrids, building a better grid. We encourage you to participate. Um, it take is taking place at Pace University, and more details will be available shortly on our website. We also want to really thank our sponsors today, who are the speak from the who are your speakers today. Um, their participation and their support is making this possible. And then finally, we always want to thank our uh, major sponsor and supporter that supports New York Best Operations the New York State Energy and Research Development Authority, NYSERDA. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill Acker, who is the Executive Director of New York Best, who is going to introduce our speakers for today. Bill. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We've got a very exciting webinar today. As you're probably aware, there are major changes to the intellectual property law of the United States, and we have with us uh, experts from three of our member uh, firms uh, to uh, explain the changes of the, uh, to the laws and their implications and uh, how this will affect you and uh, other interesting information that I think uh, will be useful to your business. Um, our, uh, our presenters, I will take you through a quick uh, overview of them and, uh, and then we'll, we'll go through a, a, a agenda that will have uh, a brief overview and then uh, t three topic areas. Um, our, uh, our presenters include Jim Maldoon, who's a partner with uh, Harris Beach. Uh, Mr. Maldoon is a member of the, uh, of the firm and, uh, and in the intellectual property uh, practice group. Uh, he also serves on the science and technology commercialization and medical life uh, sciences industry team. Uh, his practice focuses on the enforcement and defense of intellectual property uh, and related claims in federal and state courts and in arbitration. Mr. Maldoon has been actively involved in a large number of patent infringement lawsuits encompassing a diverse set of technologies uh, that, uh, that span through a lot of areas uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the scientific field uh, um, and, uh, and also the, uh, including uh, the areas that uh, our members deal with. Um, he counsels uh, numerous clients uh, on uh, their uh, assessments of intellectual property portfolios and on the licensing and sales of intellectual property rights. Uh, he's been included in the upstate uh, edition of New York Super Lawyers annually since 2007 and has been selected as uh, 2013 uh, top rated lawyer in intellectual property by the American Lawyers uh, Lawyer Media and uh, Martindale uh, Hubbell. Um, before joining uh, Harris Beach, uh, um, Mr. Maldoon uh, served as a partner in a Syracuse law firm and interestingly also uh, served as a Navy judge advocate and a Navy pilot. Um, uh, Nick is uh, Nick Masidi is from uh, Heslin Rothenberg, Farley and Masidi, a partner there. Um, he is an intellectual property lawyer and partner in, in the firm uh, and has served as lead counsel in a number of successful intellectual property law cases, including complex patent infringement law cases. 
Um, Mr. Mercedes is a graduate from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 1985 and uh, with a BS degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, he acquired his law degree in 1988 from Albany Law School and he is admitted in the bar in, uh, in the state of New York and uh, numerous uh, uh, federal district and appellate courts. Mr. Mercedes is also registered to practice before the, uh, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Our uh, final um, speaker uh, is uh, Spencer Warnick. Um, he is a uh, partner in Huffman uh, Warnick, uh, and um, Mr. Warnick's uh, practice encompasses a wide scope of intellectual property matters, including rights procurement, infringement negotiations, opinions, and client portfolio counseling. Mr. Warnick has represented clients ranging from independent inventors to large corporate entities and has extensive experience in preparing patent infringement and validity enfor and enforcement opinions. Uh, Mr. Warnick has been involved in intellectual property fields since 1990, starting uh, at the U.S. Uh, patent and Trademark Office in Washington, D.C. as a patent examiner. Um, his education, he has a um, bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Union College, uh, is a founding member of the, uh, of the AU uh, Intellectual Property Law Council, and, uh, at, and has his uh, JD from American uh, University. Um, our uh, speakers uh, today, as I indicated, will um, uh, will first give a, a brief overview, and that uh, Nick Basidi from Hessel and Arthur Farm CD will open it up, and then we'll go through the various speakers. Thank you, Bill. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm from the law firm of Hessel and Rothenberg, Farley and Basidi. We are uh, an intellectual property law boutique firm. We exclusively practice in the area of intellectual property. We have 30 professionals who are dedicated to practicing uh, IP law, including patent law, and we have the largest such law firm in uh, upstate New York, north of, uh, north of New York City. Now, there have been recent changes to the patent laws under what's known as the American Invents Acts. We call it the AIA. Uh, the AIA is the most significant patent legislation act within recent memory. We have approximately one hour webinar today, and we obviously cannot cover all of the changes in that particular time. But what we will do is we will address uh, the major changes and give uh, you a brief uh, overview and uh, summary of what those changes are. So the, the AIA, the intent behind the AIA is to fundamentally change the patent laws of the United States to bring them more in harmony with some of the uh, European and other countries throughout uh, the world. And this is done under the AIA by moving to what's called a first to file system rather than what was previously a first to invent system. So now priority is based upon first to file an application for a patent, not first to invent. The other type of uh, changes to harmonize more with uh, other countries is the uh, adoption or institution of more opposition type procedures, which are procedures which allow the public to challenge the validity of recently granted patents before the patent office. The intent here under the AIA is to give greater certainty about patent rights by moving to the first to file rule and to also institute uh, lower fees for uh, small parties, independent inventors, and micro entities, and to provide more efficient and less expensive alternatives to litigation. So, moving to the specifics or more specifics here, the first part of our webinar will be by Spencer Warnick, who will address the first inventor to file uh, changes under the AIA. After that, Jim Muldoon will discuss post-grant review procedures, or these opposition type procedures, which I mentioned earlier. And then finally, I will discuss some patent litigation changes which have been instituted under the AIA. With that, I'll leave it to Spencer Warnick. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as 
Next up, my name is Spencer Warnick. I am a managing partner at Hoffman Warnick. We are an intellectual property law boutique. That's all we do. We are in Albany, New York. Our headquarters are there. We have about 20 professionals uh, covering practically all sorts of technologies that you can come up with. Uh, we have offices in Rochester, Albany, and Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, I'm going to walk you through this afternoon as best I can, give you a 10,000 foot view of the first inventor to file changes that, that Nick mentioned. Um, so let me turn to the first slide. Um, so what's new? Nick, Nick mentioned it. The United States is going to a first to file uh, system as opposed to a first to invent system. What this means is whoever the first inventor to file is at the patent office determines who receives the U.S. patent. Um, there are certain grace periods that we're going to discuss, um, and we'll walk through those in a little bit. These laws were effective for all applications filed on or after March 16, 2013. So we are, we are into that process already. Um, for those of you who have patent applications that are already pending, um, if you file what they call continuation part applications, these are applications where you add subject matter to the application, or you file other continuations or divisional applications, for those of you who are familiar with the process. These applications are going to come under the first inventor to file system also. Um, so you've got to keep that in mind as you're going forward. One catch is with the old laws still apply to everything filed prior to March 16, 2013. Um, so we have to keep that in mind where these are very complex situations because we have two sets of laws that are applying right now. Everything before March 16th is the same old laws that we've had for a while, and everything afterwards is uh, the, the new laws. Because it's so complex, there's a new set of laws. I'm going to put, put a big caveat on here, as us lawyers tend to like to do. If you have a problem, if you get in, into the process of patenting something, you really should consult a patent attorney early in the process. Um, as, as we were talking about earlier here, it's very hard for us to keep it straight, um, and it's important that if you have questions, to go and talk to a patent attorney or, as early in the process as you possibly can. So. American Events Act, First Amendment File Changes is up on the screen here. Uh, 102 is a section that deals mostly with that. Um, it's, 102 basically defines what novelty is, basically what they want to define, what has to happen in order for something to be patentable. It's more accurately said to be what defines what is prior art. And, and for those who aren't familiar with patent law, prior art is basically evidence of what can be used against you to prevent you from getting a patent. It's also stuff that you can do to yourself um, that can prevent you from getting a patent. Um, so that's what really what 102 describes, and we're, we're going to walk through that, the new law. Another section of 102 also defines the exceptions to this, um, what is prior art and what, what you can and can't get away with. So um, let's jump in. I'm, I'm going to throw you the one statue I'm going to show to everyone is the 102 section. I won't show you all of them, I promise you, because I, I can tell you if, you if you have insomnia, this is a great way to put yourself to sleep is to read through these statutes. Um, they are tough to read through and um, tough to understand sometimes. So 102 says a person is entitled to a patent unless the claim to invention was patented, described in a printed publication, or in public use, on sale, or otherwise available to the public before the effective filing date of the claim to invention. That, that's the first part, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that for a little bit. The first four sections up there, patented, described in a printed publication, public use, and on sale, um, those of you who are familiar with patent law have probably heard those before. Those, those have been around a little bit, and we'll touch on those a little bit. The otherwise available to the public is really what's kind of a catch-all that they're throwing in now that is new. Um, what you won't see in here now is stuff that deals with first invent. It's all based on who is first to file. That's the way the statute's going to, that's the way the language is set up to be. So um, we'll talk a little bit here about some notes about this first part. Uh, 102A1, this prior art may be by anyone, including the inventor and his or her company, and anywhere in the world. That's, that's a big change for the United States. Um, prior to this, if, if you're familiar with the statute, it was, if there, were, there were exceptions. It had to be by another. Um, certain patents had to be in the English language. Some of the activity had to happen in the United States. That's not the case anymore. So any, anyone doing this, doing publications or disclosures, anywhere in the world can act as evidence against uh, a patent. Um, that's for getting the patent and for enforcement, or um, excuse me, invalidity. So, big change. Um, let me run down some of the details of patented. Again, it's not restricted to U.S. patents anymore. Can be anywhere in the world. Admissions are still prior art. That's something that we're kind of concerned about as the things went on, but we were instructed by the patent office recently that admissions are still prior art, so you need to be careful about what is said in your patent applications, um, what is said openly to others. 
public use. This is very similar to what was in before the American Invents Act. Uh, things have to be accessible to the public or commercially exploited to be considered um, public use on sale. Um, also very similar to pre-American Vent Act um, activity. It needs to be uh, subject to commercial sale or offer and ready for patenting. So those, those standards haven't quite changed. This new area, otherwise available to the public, is Congress's attempt to try to pull in all the different types of evidence that you can possibly come upon um, that is public. Uh, the, not quite sure how this is all going to play out in the future. The PTO has given us some examples that you see listed on the slide. Um, the one that sticks out to me is documents electronically posted on the Internet. Um, in the old regime, it was always kind of a question as to how much public access there has to be, how do you determine dates and everything. This, this new regime under first inventor file is going to be much less tolerant of disclosures. If, if it's out there and it has any type of public access, it can and will be used against you. Um, commercial transactions not constituting a sale also is another one you've got to keep an eye on. Um, those are things that you can do to yourself to some degree. Um, I've given you kind of a quick graph here to simplify it down a little bit. Basically summarizes what's in the statute. I mean, it's patented, published, public use, on sale, otherwise a little public, and you can see it's, it's anywhere. Um, it has, doesn't have to be in the United States. You could do something in Europe that's going to cause you to lose your patent. Um, before respective filing date, that's all it has to be is before you file. So very unforgiving. Next slide, uh, this is again the statutes if you have insomnia. This lists off the exceptions. I'm going to try to simplify this down to you in the, in the next slides so you don't have to understand it. The italicized parts you see in this are my additions so, I, so you can keep straight that what the really kind of best way of titling them out. Um, first exception to this rule about pending is inventor disclosure grace period. Um, one year or less before the effective filing date and by the inventor or joint inventor. This is where the inventor goes and discloses something at a convention or perhaps puts it in a journal publication. Um, it'll give you this exception. Uh, one key thing I, I pick up on this about this particular exception is you can't have additional authors and inventors that, on the disclosure. Um, this is a, I think, a, a comes, one that comes to mind immediately to me is when someone's writing a journal article and they have a guy who helps them out in the you know, in the lab and they put his name on it and they publish the journal article. And then when they go to file the patent application, they put the actual inventors on it and they leave the guy who helped them in the lab off. And all of a sudden that disclosure becomes prior art against them. And it's, it's no harm done it, but there is harm done it. You, you think you're helping the guy out and, and it can kill you. So at least make a big mess where you're trying to f explain the way the authorship on something like that. Next uh, exception is non-inventor disclosure grace period. This is one year left before the effective filing date and by another to obtain the subject matter directly or indirectly from the inventor and joint inventor. This is uh, where we get talking about here, some of these guys talking about derivation. This is where someone is, has somehow obtained this information from the inventor and goes and publishes it, maybe in an attempt to try to prevent the inventor from obtaining a patent. They're going to give you an exception for this. Um, Third type you hear part C is what they call uh, intervening disclosure grace period. This is where the inventor discloses it and someone's trying to be a little sneaky and they try to take the information that they saw published and they also go and publish it in their own name. Uh, so it's an intervening one. It's between, between the inventor's disclosure and the, the, um, the effective filing date of the invention. So they'll, give you a, they'll give you a break, an exception on that also. A couple notes on these exceptions. The PTO may, is going to probably require evidence to show derivation when it comes to these um, cases where the, someone else, a third party, has gone and disclosed it um, and derived it from the, from the inventor. Keeping those notebooks, as, as most of you know, the process from first inventor is still really important. You still need to keep that information so that you can prove that you had the information in your possession when someone goes and does this. Um, I'm also throwing on records of disclosure, also much more important to keep. Um, more so, I think, in the past, and then most people would, would do it anyway, but I think now I mean, you need to show not that something was disclosed, but also what was disclosed. Who was it disclosed to? Um, I didn't put it in the slide, and I, I regret having not done so. No, non-disclosure agreements become much more important in this setting because they actually act as proof of what was disclosed and when. Um, so they, they become much more important. Very important reminder here, okay, about this particular scheme of what we're doing. Um, the rest of the world does not have these exceptions. 
Okay, so it's the same situation we had with First Invent. If you go and disclose something, you, you're very likely are destroying most of your patent rights outside of the United States. Um, so really important, and, and I'll, say that, I'll say this over again, don't rely on these exceptions. Um, you want to file first, mark it second, and that has not changed. Uh, the second part is person entitled to patent unless the claimed invention was described in the US, in, excuse me, was described in an issued U.S. patent or an application for patent published or deemed published in which the patent or application names another inventor was effectively filed before the effective filing date of the claimed invention. Um, this fills out kind of a graph of what, how it simplifies it. Um, U.S. published applications effectively filed before the filing date anywhere designated in the United States. Sections to the second part, there's three of them. Again, this is a statute, a little wordy. Uh, the italicized parts are my additions to help summarize a little bit. This is kind of my simplification so you can understand what's going on here. Non-inventor disclosure exception. Removes patents, published applications of another who obtained from the inventor. Again, they want to give, give inventors breaks if something's happened within the year, um, or excuse me, not within the year, but taken from them. Uh, and then inventor and inventor originated prior public disclosure exception, where, where, again, where there's an intervening disclosure. That's what that second paragraph in the statute deals with, where the inventor disclosed it, someone takes it, and tries to also disclose it. So both, I want, one point I want to make is both A and B above will be require affidavit of proof. Again, those notebooks and records of disclosure are, are very important along that line. Last exception is kind of ownership exception. Uh, this deals with U.S. patents, U.S. published applications, PCT, uh, what they call WIPO, publications which designate the U.S. and are owned by the same person or under an obligation to assign, has to name another inventor, and it has to be before the effective filing date. That is, the ownership has to be before the effective filing date. They don't want you to file and then go off and run off and try to put together an agreement of common ownership with somebody to try to obviate the um, re possible rejection against you. Um, it's nice for companies where you have people filing on numerous different things and uh, have different inventorships on it. They'll give you a break on, on those as acting as priority against you. Commonly owned disclosure, however, may still be um, prior on the first part we talked about earlier, so we need to be mindful of that. A uh, couple takes away we'll run through here. Um, like I said before, do not disclose before filing if you can help it. Uh, you, you really, reliance on these exceptions is an extremely scary proposition. Uh, none of us are really sure how the courts are going to interpret these, the language that's in there. You're kind of open to the discretion of the courts. It's un unclear whether these grace periods will apply to uses and sales. Um, it's also a uh, non-public use or sale does not trigger the exception. You've got to be careful of that. Um, again, you may lose your foreign uh, rights if you go and you disclose first before filing. So what do we do about this? Um, the provisional patent applications in the U.S., are a really good process to take advantage of to address these, the situation. Um, you can also file outside of the U.S. prior to disclosing. Um, one process that um, pharmaceuticals typically use and has become much more widely used is, is filing the provisional patent applications during development. If you develop something else, file another one on the additions. And then within that one year that you're allowed to file that utility patent application and claim priority back to the provisionals, go back and claim as many to the provisionals as you possibly can. Um, allows you to keep developing, but also get something on file. Get you that date, get you the protection um, before you go and disclose it. And the last one, again, I wanted to reemphasize everyone, the old laws still apply to everything filed prior to March 16, 2013. Both sets of laws are very complicated, and if you have questions um, regarding patenting, you should consult a patent attorney early in the process. Uh, that's all I have, and we'll turn it over to Nick. Oh, Jim, sorry. Thanks, Spence. Uh, my name is Jim Muldoon, and I'm a member of Harris Beach. Harris Beach is a National Law Journal top 250 uh, law firm. Uh, while I used to be a managing partner of an intellectual property boutique, Harris Beach is a general practice law firm with more than 200 attorneys throughout the state. While we assist clients in uh, corporate matters, labor, commercial litigation, all the general things. We also have a full IP practice. As I was looking into the membership in New York Best today, I noticed a substantial overlap between uh, the geographic locations of the members of New York Best, which are represented in the blue dots on the map, and Harris Beach's 13 offices across the state and 
uh, in the metro area. I don't think there's a member outside of maybe Clarkston up there in the north who's more than 75 miles from one of Harris Beach's offices. One of the practice areas that should be of interest to uh, New York Best members is our energy industry team. Uh, it's led by Bill Flynn, the former head of the New York Public Service Commission and uh, former president of NYSERDA, and also includes uh, Susan Crossett, the former vice president of U.S. Economic Development and Community Investment for National Grid. They represent a lot of uh, energy, energy industry companies uh, providing strategic counsel uh, regarding uh, regulated utilities and market participants. Firm al uh, also, the energy practice also facilitates participation in renewable portfolio standards, system benefit charges, and NYSERDA administrative economic programs. In addition to the energy practice, Harris Beach has a full intellectual property practice group. Uh, Harris Beach has been named a go-to litigation firm because of our IP litigation work uh, by uh, corporate counsel magazines and other uh, industry groups. We have a dedicated practice to uh, help clients assist, uh, acquire, and protect their intellectual property rights. Uh, There is a, have been a number of long-standing uh, criticisms of the U.S. patent system. Uh, a lot of this uh, deals with public perceptions of a large number of poor quality patents, uh, that patent rights were very expensive to litigate whether uh, someone else was infringing or whether uh, another party had uh, patent rights that were potentially too broad and invalid. There was an earlier proceeding uh, that was put into effect about 15 years ago called inter-parties re-examination, but there was some limited success with that. Challenging patents in this uh, administrative litigation proceeding before the patent office was still too long uh, and too expensive. I had several uh, inter-parties re-examinations that lasted more than five or six years. The America Invents Act has gone ahead and instituted or changed several of the proceedings that are available through the Patent Office to help challenge uh, the scope of another party's uh, patent rights, their rights to exclude other people from making, using, or selling their invention. Uh, and these include the submission of prior art during another party's examination of their patent before the USPTO. Uh, there is still an ex parte re-examination, but now there is, are new procedures of an inter partes review, a post-grant review, and some special uh, provisions that are going to be in effect for a few years covering the review of covered business methods. Uh, there is also a new proceeding called supplemental examination that will go ahead and allow a patent owner to clear some of the potential problems they may have where prior art was not necessarily fully disclosed. Prior art submissions allow a third party to submit prior art patents and other printed publications that the examining uh, individuals at the patent office will consider and include in the record of another party's uh, patent application. In order to go ahead and submit these references, the uh, person submitting them must include a concise description of the relevance of the prior art references to the claims of the challenged patent. The problem with prior art submissions is that there's only a limited time in which you can make those submissions. Uh, patent applications remain confidential and non-public until 18 months after uh, the earliest priority application is filed, uh, and therefore there's only a limited window uh, before the first rejection of the uh, patent application or prior to a notice of allowance 
and within six months of that publication. So you really have to stay aware of where your competitors' applications are uh, in order to be to effectively take advantage of prior art submissions. Ex parte reexamination procedures remain unchanged by the uh, AIA, but will still be a very important tool in challenging the rights of another party. Challenges on, in an, an ex parte reexamination can only be made upon prior art patents and printed publications, but the reexamination may be commenced throughout the enforceable term of the patent. In order to uh, establish a uh, ex parte reexamination, the request must show that there is a substantial new question to the patentability uh, of the claims of the issued patent. That substantial new question may be raised by uh, putting a prior art reference that was even cited by the examiner in a new light that uh, would raise a substantial question to those claims as they issued. However, in an ex parte reexamination, the requester is not involved in the prosecution of the reexamination after there is a substantial new question determination. And more importantly, there is no legal estoppel from the end result of the ex parte reexamination against the uh, challenger. Therefore, if they are still sued uh, after the conclusion of the reexamination, they will have the opportunity to raise those same invalidity defenses on those prior art patents and printed publications within the scope of the litigation. The new procedure that's been established by the AIA uh, is inter partes review, and this replaces the old inter partes reexamination. Whereas a regular patent prosecution is done on an ex parte basis, meaning only the applicant deals directly with the patent office examiner, in an inter partes review, the challenger will remain centrally involved in the whole scope of the reexamination and has a chance to comment uh, and make arguments upon the prior art references and the comments of the patent owner during reexamination. Inter partes review is also limited to patents and printed publications, but instead of proceeding before a member of the examining court at the patent office, uh, inter partes review will proceed before a three-judge panel of the new Patent Trial and Appeals Board. Uh, this board has just come into effect in the last six months. There's only been uh, about approximately 200 new proceedings uh, that have been instituted in the last uh, seven months since the uh, establishment of the PTAB. In order to provoke an inter partes review, the requester must show that there's a reasonable likelihood that he, uh, he will prevail with respect to the invalidity challenge of at least one of the claims of the patent. An important distinction that the AIA has established is that over prior inter partes review and even ex, ex parte reexamination is that a decision by the PTAB is required to be issued within 12 months of the grant of the petition. There is a possibility for one six-month extension, but that is a substantial improvement over the uh, three to six, even seven years of an inter partes reexamination. There is an important difference in the estoppel effects. Those arguments that you raise in an inter partes review will be binding on the challenger later on uh, in any litigation over the patent. That estoppel extends uh, to both issues that were actually raised in the inter-parties review as well as those issues that could have reasonably been raised. And the estoppel will attach on the decision of the PTAB rather than at the exhaustion of all appeals. An inter-parties review is a lot more expensive than the inter-parties reexamination that it replaced. Uh, the fees used to be uh, approximately $27,000 submitted at the time of your request, and they've uh, PTO has recently changed that arrangement so that there's initially a $9,000 fee due upon filing the request, and if the uh, inter partes review is instituted, there'll be another $14,000 in post-institution fees that will be chargeable. 
Inter-parties review will be available for all patents, regardless of the issue date, so they'll apply to uh, patents that were initially obtained under the first to invent system, as well as under the first in inventor to file system. If a party is sued for infringement in a federal district court action, uh, and they want to take advantage of the uh, expedited procedures of inter-parties review, they must initiate that review within one year of being sued. The next mechanism for a patent challenger uh, that's been instituted uh, under the AIA is for post-grant review. Now, while the, the procedures have been established for post-grant review, uh, post-grant review is only available for patents that were filed under the first inventor to file system. So it'll probably be at least another year before there's a first post-grant review proceeding that's going to be uh, conducted before the PTO. Post-grant review is supposed to be similar to the uh, patent opposition proceedings in Europe, but there are some uh, particularities that are, that are different. There is a broader range of prior art that can be considered in a post-grant review. Uh, not only prior art matters, such as novelty and obviousness, but whether or not uh, the subject matter of the patent was appropriately fully descriptive or enabled will also be there. Uh, there's also a higher threshold for uh, establishing post-grant review uh, that it is more likely than not that a challenge claim is unpatentable. Uh, unlike in infringement litigation where claims, where, I'm sorry, where invalidity must be proved beyond uh, or upon clear and convincing evidence, in a post-grant review, the claims uh, are determined and their broadest reasonable interpretation and the challenger must only show a mere preponderance. Estoppel issues still do come into play with respect to uh, post-grant review similar to the inter partes review. There is a transitional period uh, during which business pat method patents can be reviewed. Uh, a covered business patent must be a method uh, of performing data processing or other operations uh, with respect to the pr administration or management of a financial product or service. Um, over the course of time, the covered business method me review will be phased out. There is a mechanism that's provided by the AIA for the patent owner to uh, try and bulletproof his patent, and that's called supplemental examination. After the uh, patent is issued, and then prior to going back and uh, asserting that patent against an alleged infringer, the patent owner may request the PTO to consider uh, and correct the patent based on information that the uh, patent owner will submit. This is primarily used to cure potential unenforceability issues with respect to inequitable conduct or failing to disclose relevant information during the course of uh, a patent examination. This slide merely uh, summarizes some of those major differences between inter partes review and post grant review. Uh, post grant review is only available within nine months after the patent has been issued. Uh, finally, uh, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board has instituted uh, substantial new rules and guidelines in the conduct of these proceedings before uh, the PTAB. Uh, they will all follow a common streamlined structure and require decisions within 12 months from the determination. Of, uh, real parties at interest must be identified in the past. In an ex parte reexamination, you didn't have to let your, the patent owner know who was providing that, uh, challenging that patent. Uh, there are also going to be procedures for testimony and document production uh, rather than merely submitting items on uh, paper. The PTAB trial practice guidelines do encourage settlement between the parties. Uh, they do have uh, the various estoppel effects that can be asserted. And upon a decision that's issued by the PTAB, PTAB uh, the party, a dissatisfied party may either request rehearing before the PTAB or appeal to the Federal Circuit. Uh, um, at that point, I'll let uh, pass the mic to Nick for his presentation.
Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm going to be speaking on one of my favorite topics, and that's uh, patent litigation, and specifically some of the uh, changes that you'll see in patent litigation under the America Invents Act. Um, patent litigation means a patent infringement lawsuit. That's what patent litigation is. It's a lawsuit brought uh, where the patent owner is charging someone with infringement of his or her patent. Now, the, the AIA has certain uh, impacts on patent litigation. Specifically, any time that there's a litigation for a patent, the, there, is, there are defenses raised defending uh, the claim of infringement. The AIA eliminates a number of defenses in patent litigation, and specifically defenses which relate to whether or not the patent is valid. Those are called invalidity defenses. For example, the invalidity defense of best mode, prior invention, and false marking, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, those are all eliminated under the AIA. Also, as, uh, as discussed earlier by, by Spencer, there's an expansion of the prior art that's now available in patent litigation. There will be more patents that qualify as prior art, more printed publications. There will be more prior public uses, more prior sales or offer for sales. And that's because now prior art includes patents and printed publications which were filed first. That was not necessarily the situation prior to the America Invents Act. Also, foreign public uses will now be available to raise in a defense of patent validity in a patent litigation. So that will, that will likely lead to some higher litigation costs and um, the ability to uncover certain prior art outside of the United States you know, could involve uh, additional resources in patent litigation. Finally, um, there are additional commercial use defenses that are now available under the AIA, and uh, I'll talk about those more specifically now. A prior commercial use is a defense to a patent infringement claim. It is different than an invalidity defense. An invalidity defense renders the patent invalid. A prior use, prior commercial use defense does not invalidate the patent. It just provides an exception for infringement. So prior to the AIA, the prior commercial use defense for infringement was only available for business method patents. That's now changed. After the AIA, prior commercial use defenses are available basically for any patents at this point, not just business method patents. So that's a major change to patent litigation under the America Invents Act. To qualify for the prior, prior commercial use defense, the, uh, the use must be a good faith commercial use. It doesn't have to be a public use. It just has to be a commercial use. It can be internal. It can be secret. It can be research and development. But it has to be a good faith commercial use. And it has to have occurred at least a year before either the effective filing date of the patent that's being asserted in litigation or at least a year before uh, the date on which the invention was disclosed to the public. The prior commercial use defense, uh, the infringer carries the burden of proof as in any defense. The standard is by clear and convincing evidence. And if the defense is not reasonably asserted, the, uh, the uh, attorney's fees are available for, uh, by the patent owner. So attorney's fees now in patent litigation are more difficult to obtain, and this is one of the bases for obtaining attorney's fees. If this defense is unreasonably raised, 
attorney's fees are available. The next uh, defense that is affected by the America Invents Act is what's known as the best mode uh, defense. There is a requirement for any patent applicant that when they file their patent application, they are obligated to disclose to the patent office and thus to the public, eventually, when the patent is published, the best mode of making and using the invention. Failure to do so prior to the AIA was a basis for invalidating the patent. So if the patent was raised in litigation and the patent owner failed to disclose the best mode in the patent, the patent could be invalidated on that basis. After the AIA, that is no longer a basis to invalidate the patent. Failure to disclose the best mode cannot be used in patent litigation now to render the patent invalid or otherwise unenforceable. Now that doesn't mean the best mode is no longer a, re a requirement. It still is a requirement and the patent office can reject uh, patent applications for failure to disclose the best mode. It's still a requirement, it just cannot be raised as an invalidity defense now for patent litigation. The next area is um, the advice of counsel. Um, when a defendant has been charged with willfully infringing a patent, in the past, the use or reliance on an advice of an attorney could be used to defend the charge of willful infringement. In 2007, the Seagate case changed that particular standard so that failure to obtain an opinion of an attorney that you did not infringe could no longer be used as a basis for willful infringement. The AIA has now codified that rule, so it's now part of the uh, statutes. Failure to get an advice of counsel when charged with infringement cannot be presented to the court or a jury as a basis for willful infringement. The next group of changes in patent litigation under the America Invents Act relate to the concept of inequitable conduct. Inequitable conduct is a uh, defense to uh, patent enforcement, and it occurs when a patent applicant made a material misrepresentation to the patent office during the application process with an intent to deceive the patent office, hence with deceptive intent. The AIA changed a number of provisions in the law, which these provisions allowed patent owners to correct problems with their patents. Prior to the AIA, a patent applicant who wished to correct one of these particular problems would have to show that the problem did not occur with deceptive intent. In other words, if a patent owner tried to get his patent reissued because he or she made a mistake, prior to the AIA they had to prove that their mistake was not made with deceptive intent. The same was true for correction of inventorship the same was true for uh, not getting a foreign filing license early enough when you filed your foreign patent applications. The same was true with a disclaimer or a terminal disclaimer of part of your patent. And the same was true for actually asserting a patent which had an invalid claim against an infringer. Before the AIA, to do any of those things or correct any of those issues, issues, you had to show that the problem was not based upon deceptive intent. That requirement has now been removed from the statutes so that you no longer have to show no deceptive intent to correct these particular problems. 
the next patent litigation issue that I'd like to, uh, to talk about is the joinder of parties uh, rules. Joinder of parties is a term that's used in patent litigation when multiple parties are essentially on the same side. So you can have multiple plaintiffs suing for patent infringement, and you can have multiple defendants which are sued for patent infringement by the same plaintiff group. If they're on the same side, they're known as joined. There are rules for when parties can be joined or when they can be on the same side. Before the American Invents Act, basically a patent owner can sue or join multiple defendants in one particular lawsuit, even though the defendants were unrelated. So you, could, you would see, for example, patent trolls out there suing in one lawsuit 15 or 20 defendants when they had no relationship to one another. The AIA has changed the joinder rules and changed that situation. So now when multiple defendants are joined in one patent infringement lawsuit, they can only be joined if their infringement involved the same transaction or occurrence or series of transactions and occurrences. And there also has to be a common question of law or fact. What that means is you have to sue the group of defendants on the same patent, and they basically have to have some relationship to one another in the supply chain. Okay. Um, if they do not have that relationship or it's not the same patent, you have to sue them in a separate lawsuit. Okay. So that's a major change um, under the uh, American Defense <coughs> Act, the joinder of parties. Um, the next set of changes relate to the marking requirements and marking defenses. And when we talk about marking, we're talking about the requirements that a product be marked with the patent number. In order to obtain damages for patent infringement, the defendant has to be notified of the infringement, or if not notified, the patent owner has to mark their product with the patent number. That's why you see you know, patent number you know, XYZ when you pick up a product. There's a marking requirement in order to obtain damages in certain situations. So marking's important. The changes to the marking rules under the American Invents Act relate to first, defenses of false marking. Prior to the AIA, anybody can sue, could use false marking or sue for false marking a patent owner who did not properly mark his or her product. That included a situation where the patent actually expired. The AIA has changed those two situations. Now, only a competitor can sue for false marking, and that competitor would have to show um, specific damages. Now there's also an ability to virtually mark the, uh, your product. In other words, instead of marking the product with patent numbers, like you'll see now a product will be marked with 15 or 20 patent numbers, you can now list the patent numbers on a website and just designate uh, your product with pat or patent and refer the um, the uh, public to that particular uh, website. Um, there's one other issue that I'd like to, to mention, and that's a new area of practice called derivation practice. Because the America Invents Act is now, uh, is now put our patent system into a first to file rather than a first to invent, the old practice of interference practice is now gone. An interference practice occurred 
when two people argued who the right inventor, the inventor was. And now that argument can only occur based upon derivation. And that's a situation where one person basically took the invention from somebody else, learned the invention from somebody else, and that somebody else filed a patent application. So essentially, when one person steals the invention from somebody else, in that situation, the aggrieved party can commence a derivation proceeding in court to declare, to get a declaration that that person is the true inventor of the, uh, of the patent. That's, uh, that's, that's all I have, and I think I'm going to turn this over now to Denise, okay. who uh, will address the questions that we might have. Well, thanks. All of you, that was wonderful. You did a great job, and you stayed very well timed. So we really do appreciate your participation. So for everyone who's still left, please stay with us. We're going to handle a couple questions. We have a, just really a, a few minutes. Um, and remember, at the end, um, we, will, we ask you to take the survey. So if you, have a, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box that's on the side of your screen, and we'll try to get to it. So we did receive a question. I'm going to direct this to you, um, Spencer, because this question came in um, as you were talking. But the question is really about, and any one of you can answer it, is how searchable are non-US patents? Um, can they be searched online? How, how can they be searched, and are there fees associated with it? Um, a good portion of foreign patents can be searched online. Um, there are. Um, commercial databases available that you can go on to that will, will search the majority of, I would say, industrialized nations' patent systems. Um, the one that comes to mind, you guys think of you know, Delphion is one you can get on and, and do pretty much search on, on pretty much all the industrialized countries. The one caveat you do have to understand with some of these countries is that unless the patent has been translated into English in some form, either through a filing at the, at the PCT, World Intellectual Property Organization, um, you may be stuck with just searching the actual abstracts of those um, patents. So there is that limitation. Uh, if, if you're looking just for prior art relative to patenting, then I would, I would encourage you to go through that process, use the commercial databases. If you're in a situation where you're in an infringement issue um, and you have to, you're worried about you know, maybe you're being sued or something like that and you have to unturn every stone, I would, I would say that that, that has a limitation. You, you're gonna, at that point, you're going to want to go to um, for an affiliate of your local patent attorney and have them find a searcher in those particular countries to search for you in the native language. Okay. There are some services, uh, particularly out of East Asia, that are offering services for a lot of the uh, uh, Chinese, Korean language patents that the U.S. and the European uh, systems have a tough time searching. So we've had some good luck with some of the services coming out of Korea. Okay, thank you, Spencer and Jim. Okay, um, let's see. We'd like to get your views on the balance between speed of filing and flushing out research and development and claims. The question also relates to multiple related patents or follow-on expansion. Who wants to start? <laughs> Nick, you look ready. Sure. Um, <laughs> Well, it's, it's still important to file as early as you possibly can. So the general advice that most attorneys are giving are file as quickly as possible. So the question is, well, how thoroughly can you file if you have to file quickly? You should file as much information and as much subject matter as you possibly need to in order to satisfy the uh, enablement requirements, the best mode requirements, and the written description requirements. Your, your patent application must include a suffi sufficient written description of what the invention is, enough information to enable a person of ordinary skill in the art to make and use the invention, as well as the best mode. The claims, which are what define the invention, can always be added or amended so long as your written description is sufficient, your enablement is sufficient, and your best mode is sufficient. So file early, put a disclosure in as best you can, 
get the claims in as early as you can, but if you can't, you can amend the claims later. Spencer, I'll let you go first and then Jim. This, this kind of ties on to what I was saying about provisional patent applications in terms of progressive developments. And file, you don't have to file just one provisional patent application. You can file, as you come up with new developments, you can file further provisional applications that, with additional material in that. Um, and as you go along, I, I would urge everyone you know, to contact a patent attorney. It, don't rely on just filing the provisional patent applications on your, on your own, um, be, mainly because you, you do want to put claims in there, as, as Nick mentioned, as early as you possibly can. And, and the reason for that being is that if you're going to go file in foreign countries, certain countries want to see what they would consider a complete patent application before they will give you priority date back to that earlier filing date. Um, so if you don't have those claims, you may be jeopardizing certain foreign rights. That's not in every country, but in some countries that is the case, and, and you want to be careful of that. Jim. I agree with Spence's comment that uh, it's not only, and mix, it's not only file early, it's file often. Uh, as a product matures through its development phase, there will be many different stages where new patentable features are added in uh, to the product. If those weren't adequately described in your first provisional, you should be filing a second provisional within that period that discloses that additional feature uh, to get the earliest priority date that you can for each of those uh, uh, patentable features. Then within the one year period from your earliest provisional date, you'll have to convert those provisionals and file a non-provisional patent application uh, claiming priority to those provisionals. So. File early, but also file often if the product's changing over time. Okay, great. Well, we are ex just up on our hour, and I think I really want to thank all of you. I know on behalf of all of us, we appreciated your sharing your knowledge and information with us. Um, I want to just make sure that everybody who's on the call um, knows that all three of these law firms and all the three of these gentlemen are near best members. Um, so if you need to reach any of them, their information and the profiles on their firms is, lo is located on the New York Best website, but you could find them all individually. Again, I want to thank Spencer Warnick from Huffman Warnick, Nick Masidi from Heslin Rothenberg, Farley and Masidi, and Jim Bondoon from Harris Beach. All of you um, obviously are a credit to your profession, and we do appreciate your sharing this information with us today. Again, please take the survey, um, and if you need any other information from us at New York Best, you can get us through our website at info at newyorkbest.org. Okay, thanks. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Please stand by.